Well, welcome to the Aspen Ideas Festival, virtually. And uh, I'm Charlie Dent. Thank you all for uh, joining us. Today, uh, I'm joined uh, with uh, three good friends with whom I served in Congress. Uh, Congressman Josh Gottheimer of uh, New Jersey, a member of the Financial Services Committee. Uh, Stephanie Murphy uh, from Florida, uh, who's on the Ways and Means and Armed Services Committee. And Brian Fitzpatrick, who's on the Intelligence, Foreign Affairs, and Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And uh, the reason we're here today is largely to talk about the House Problem Solvers Caucus, uh, an organization that I was actually a, a part of when I served here. I was one of the founding members and uh, very proud that this tradition has been carried on. Uh, Josh and Brian are the, the co-chairs, uh, Josh being the Democrat and uh, Brian the Republican co-chair. Uh, Stephanie is part of it too, as, as in addition to being one of the co-chairs of the uh, House uh, Blue Dog uh, Caucus. So that, I thought I'd just kind of open it up very informally and, and thought I'd just start with you, Josh, and just say, you know, Tell us about the Problem Solvers Caucus. What is it? You know, some people watching here today probably have no idea what you do, or what, what you're about. And most people are usually shocked when we, when we tell them what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 29 Democrats and 29 Republicans that come together every week with one purpose, which is to actually get things done and to figure out where we can agree versus where we disagree uh, with a, a general principle of putting country over party. And we have three basic rules to be part of the group. Um, one, it's always even between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, two. Uh, when we get to 75% of us agreeing on something, we all stand together as a block and we support it. And three, uh, besides making sure you show up at meetings, you actually, um, uh, believe it or not, we don't, we make an oath not to campaign against each other, uh, to go on people's districts against each other. We actually work together, build relationships mm -hmm. and trust, uh, and, uh, and focus on, on getting a yes instead of uh, the places where, where it's easy around here to, uh, to disagree. Yeah, and, and, and Brian, I was going to just mention, ask, ask you actually, how is it, you know, from the Republican side, is it uh, difficult to get members to join uh, the caucus? Uh, you know, you, I know you have to, you have this Noah's Ark theory of membership. You have to come in pairs, right? So if you're coming as a Republican, you need to bring a Democrat. So what's it like? Yeah, I mean, side? the only reticence is some people, I mean, as Josh mentioned, we, we do have that block voting rule um, because the whole point is to be able to circumvent or overcome the wings. Um, that have had a, a history of hijacking a lot of legislation on the floor. So we wanted that centrist block to be able to stick together. Uh, some people have concerns about that, um, about making that commitment, but um, you know, if they have that hesitation, they probably shouldn't be in the group to begin with because as Josh mentioned, we're trying to get the yes. Uh, we're not here to talk about what we disagree with. You keep those things on the side of the road, you can come back to them tomorrow. Uh, but the things we agree on, get them done. Merge them together, get them done, move forward, and move on to the next problem. Got it. And, and Stephanie, you're kind of dual-hatted here in that you're the, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Blue Dog Caucus and also uh, problem solvers. What's, what's your perspective on, on, the, on the group and what's your experience been? Well, I think, you know, problem solvers um, serves a really important role in a Congress that is increasingly um, uh, dysfunctional and driven by the extremes because um, problem solvers puts together uh, <coughs> compromises and provides a pathway um, for legislation uh, to move forward, kind of lays out roadmaps. And I think that's a really important role that Problem Solvers has been able to play. And you know, last year, at the end of last year, uh, this group, you put together a really interesting COVID relief plan. <coughs> at the end of the year, you kind of, but I liked what you did, you, you put together what looked like, you know, what should have been the ultimate deal, which it's, I, my experience was that you know, each side, you know, Republicans, if they're in charge, they'll, they'll lay down a marker that's, you know, very conservative, the Democrats, very progressive, and you guys came out with a proposal that, you know, should have been the final product. And, it, and that's pretty much what you did. I mean, you presented a plan that was pretty darn close to what was accepted by the full Congress and signed into law. Can you tell us, like, how that came about? What did you, what did you guys do to, to put that all together? Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, we were stuck. Uh, the Congress was, as uh, Stephanie and Brian know well, and we were all talking and incredibly frustrated. We knew we had to get another package done. This was going into last summer, right. and you know, we, we had to help small businesses. We had to help people who were still struggling, right? And we had to really help make sure we got the vaccines ready and out there. Uh, but our leaderships, like is often the case, stopped talking. Everyone just kind of walked away from the table, and no one would get together. You know, our unfortunately these days, as Stephanie just pointed out, you know, it's so dysfunctional that people who normally would have to talk to each other just don't. Right. And so we decided, hey, why don't we try to throw something together and put, a, put a, a, our, a, our plan out there of what we think would be the best uh, answer, which 
by the way, we knew both sides would have issues with. You know, that's how these things are. And so we got together and worked for a month around the clock, a group, and put out our, our plan. We called it March to Common Ground. It was about $900 billion. Uh, and uh, both sides liked a lot of it, and both sides didn't like a lot of it. And then we helped get people back to the table, worked very closely with the White House in that process, and, our, and a group of Senate colleagues that now we, we work with on a regular basis, Democrats and Republicans. And we all got, then all got together and eventually got something done. And obviously, the President signed it into law at the, uh, at the end of last year. Yeah, no, it was very impressive because, uh, you know, it's, it's the way the, the Congress is supposed to work. There used to be a time when the leaders uh, would, you know, present the bills and then, you know, ultimately try to reach the compromise. But I, I found that, in my experience, that the leaders were having a much harder time getting, you know, getting to that final compromise because they're getting so much pressure from their bases. And on the Republican side, the conservative wing is, uh, is very strong <coughs> and is reluctant to... You know, it puts pressure on the leadership not to compromise. I suspect the same thing is happening in the Democratic Party with the more progressive members putting pressure. And, uh, and you guys kind of broke the ice, you know, from the back bench, which is really unusual. So congratulations. And uh, so I ask you, too, because now here we are, you know, in infrastructure week again. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you, you seem to be, uh, you know, in the middle of that as well. Can you kind of tell, Brian, can you tell us what you guys are doing on infrastructure? You know, you're trying to put together a plan and... and uh, you know, this is a very dynamic situation, I know, and so we're just curious to see what, what the latest is. Yeah, so we, uh, we've taken it and we've broken it out into three parts. Um, step one was defining infrastructure, what we wanted it to be uh, as a caucus. Uh, we agreed to that, we endorsed that, and that was um, leading up to... You mean like uh, the scope? It, it, no, that's... Uh, so the scope is phase two, which we yeah. just also endorsed. So originally it was a definition. We had a blueprint of what we want included in the bill. So when we went to uh, Governor Hogan's uh, residence in Annapolis, uh, we came around that concept. We endorsed that. We got uh, three-fourths of the caucus to endorse it. What we just endorsed last week was the scope, uh, about $1.25 trillion over eight years. Uh, and we allocated uh, amounts to each of the um, definition items that we had in phase one. Uh, and then phase three is obviously the paid force, uh, which is going to be a more difficult conversation. But we wanted to put a price point out there that ironically was really dead center between the, the competing Republican and Democrat proposals. And that's the whole point of our caucus. Um, the Democrats create their wish list in an ideal world that's not real. The Republicans create their wish list that's not real. We create something that nobody's in love with, but everyone's okay with, and it is real because it's a product of compromise. Got it. And, and maybe Josh or Stephanie, you talk about the definitions. Um, you know, Brian talked about the 1.25 trillion is the, 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 I guess, the scope. You know, you you, you got pay for us, but what's what? How how have we defined infrastructure? You, you, I... um, well, I think in order for us to um, pass a uh, put together a bill that can be as bold as the votes will bear, uh, we had to sort of narrow the right. definition of infrastructure from the original um, Democratic proposal of what was infrastructure, um, and really just focus on hard infrastructure and broadband. Um, and those were the most So hard being like, you know, road, bridges, roads, bridges water, <laughs> sewer. Exactly. Okay. And, um, that would include ports and airports, air, air seaports. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and broadband, of course. Yeah. And those, those are things that I think every American understands we need right. to make significant investments in. There's broad support around uh, those making investments in those areas, and they are probably the areas of most pressing need. Um, and having scoped it to something that everybody can agree on, both Democrats and Republicans, um, uh, enabled us to move to that next step of allocating top line numbers to that. And now we're going to get to the interesting part, which is the pay force. Yeah. Um, I'm a, a blue dog, um, and we're united behind a strong fiscal um, <coughs> responsibility as well as a strong uh, national security and working in a pragmatic way. And the pay for part is always the hardest part, but um, I'm sure that uh, problem solvers will work in the same way that they did in scoping infrastructure to um, identify what are palatable and acceptable pay for. Sure. And uh, one other quick question on this. Now that the earmarks seem to be returning, do you think uh, there will be earmarks in the infrastructure package? Not necessarily your package, but uh, overall, do you think you're going to see earmarks in the... Uh yeah, people have been using the earmark process for the uh, regular surface transportation bill as right. well as the appropriations um, bills. Um, and I think uh, that is, you know, earmarks, they, they brought them back with a more transparent process right. um, to make sure that uh, it's a process that the American people can have faith, good faith in. 
Good. Uh, by the way, I, I did serve when we had earmarks, and uh, and uh, I I discouraged some of my colleagues from taking them. That just meant, that just meant there were more for me, <laughs> and, uh, and so I used them very effectively. So I'm glad to see that uh, you're doing. As a former appropriator and a former member of the T and I committee, transportation committee, uh, it was I found them to be very beneficial. You could do a lot from that. Uh, on, on the issue of the pay force, uh, I guess I don't know what. Uh, can you maybe just say what's on the table right now? in terms of uh, the pay for even though I, I understand, you know, as of now, there's not an agreement, but you might, uh, what, what you think would be Brian, doable. Take one first? I mean, I think, I think in fairness, everything, everything's gotta be on the table. That's how you have to start the conversation. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that um, we can do to get close to that number without getting to the true revenue generators. We have the closure of the tax gaps and IRS enforcement, yeah. um, which depending on who you talk to, uh, could be a big chunk. Uh, we have the P3 option. That's a, um, a public-private partnership. Public-private yeah. partnership. So um, um, Salt Lake City Airport, huge expansion. Delta paid a big chunk of that. If we're doing a broadband build-out, Netflix is going to benefit. They should have some skin in the game. Uh, if we're building uh, you know, the EV uh, charger station deployment nationwide, Tesla will benefit. You know, all these companies should you know, help us expand the use of the federal taxpayer dollar. You know, and, and I'll just add to that, you know, and the other things on the table include things like user fees and, yep. yeah. and, um, and you know, there's some uh, resources that were not necessarily uh, uh, utilized from some of the COVID packages that I think can be repositioned. So there's, but Brian's point is exactly right. You, you have to go into this saying, here's, on, here's what's on the table to have a real conversation. Not everyone's going to love everything. Uh, but the question is, can you can you get to agreement? We've been working with our Senate colleagues on on just that. You, know, you guys mentioned the the, the, the Teslas. Uh, you know, the, the guy who drives the Tesla probably got some tax benefits for buying one. Very wealthy, but it's an expensive car. You know, doesn't pay any gasoline tax. Uh, but you, have, you have two, Charlie. I I, I have none. I have none. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still on an internal combustion engine, and so uh, I haven't progressed that far. But but that individual who's probably on the higher end of the income scale really isn't paying for use of the highway. Uh, do you have a remedy there, like a vehicle mile travel tax for, for the electric vehicles? <coughs> How are you gonna address these, not just the electric vehicles, but other alternative fuel vehicles that are gonna probably come on the market, whether they're hydrogen fuel cells or they're you know, uh, LNG? How, how, do you, how do you get revenue out of those folks who use the, the system? Do you want to talk about the VMTs? I mean, that's, and that's part of what's on the table yeah. in our discussions. Yeah, I mean, there, there's got to be parity, obviously, between um, traditional versus electric vehicles. Um, the proposals are VMTs. Uh, another proposal are tires. That's one thing that all vehicles mm -hmm. have, no matter how right. they're run. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, ideas out there. And also, you know, dealing, you know, taxing the battery upon installation and amortizing it over the course of the, the life of the vehicle. So there's, there's ways to address that EV situation. Um, but I think, you know, if we can get to these other items like closing the tax gaps and P3s and then find out what's remaining and then we can figure out how to, how to tackle that. You know, I was going to shift gears a little bit uh, from infrastructure just to talk about Congress right now and what you all are feeling and thinking, particularly since, you know, January 6th with all the, you know, the, the, the insurrection and, and what had occurred. You know, how are relationships now uh, between members you know are you know here, here you are the, the 29 and 29 what's 58 of you uh, so you know you all have good relationships uh, but how is it beyond the problem solvers caucus you know do people want to work together right now or is there, is there... I only talk to these two people I don't know, yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> you know I think um, one of the things is gonna, that's going to be super helpful to a return to a more normal working relationship is the um, being back on the floor. This week is the first week that we are without masks. We can finally see people and recognize them. Um, and you're starting to see the kinds of conversations that can't happen in a Zoom because they happen in a hallway. You know, there's no, there's no water cooler on Zoom that you, yeah. you can chat. And so you're starting to see those conversations happen on the floor. Um, and I think that's going to go a long way to repairing the relationships and to um, creating a, an environment where we are all trying to work together again. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something I noticed, too, that, you know, like, I mean, during this whole pandemic, you would all go in and vote, what, 10 at a time, right? And so you go in, you march in, and you'd vote, then you'd pretty much leave, right? 
So there's and one of the most fun parts of the job, of course, was hanging out on the House well, floor the during floor. votes. Right. I often equated it to like a prison yard. You know, every, <laughs> there are gangs all hanging out in certain areas, and you're moving around, and, and you knew where people were sitting. Uh, but the, the Pennsylvania, you know, the corner. Pennsylvania corners here. <laughs> yes. You know, the, 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 the blue dogs are here, and you know, the, uh, the, the that's pretty Caucus funny. Sat there, uh, but uh, that was like part of the fun of the whole yeah. thing and all the in, informal interaction. I, I, so that, how did it go? Yesterday was your first time. Uh, was that the first vote? Uh, yeah, we've been slowly coming back with, with masks on the floor and then no masks on the floor. I mean, see, your, your point is a really important one. It's been, for everybody in the country, this has been a very difficult time, right, in terms of normal relationships because you're on Zoom. Uh, uh, so, you know, like everybody, it's great to be in the office and with your colleagues and, and spend time together. And it's true that a lot of the conversation kind of happens on the side organically. You just talk about stuff. We, you know, the good news about what we've done is the 58 of us get together uh, even on Zoom every week and build these relationships, but it's been tough because you don't actually see each other and you're just meeting people for the first time in a little box. It's hard, yeah. um, but that's changing and most of what we do is based on trust and relationships so that you can have an honest conversation with each other and say, hey, are you okay with this? Now, nah, if you moved it this way, I could, I could get on board and that's the kind of thing that's been missing and, and I'm really hoping comes back now. Yeah. You seen anything, Brian? How, how, how are you feeling about relationships? They were definitely stressed and taxed for sure, and, and I think it was a combination of a lot of things happening at once. You had COVID and the, the physical separation and the mask. You couldn't even see people's expressions on their faces. We weren't hanging out socially because everything was shut down on the outside. Uh, on top of that, you had a very divisive political environment with a divisive presidential election. Uh, and then on top of that, layered on top of that, you had January 6th. So it definitely took a toll on relationships. There's no question about it. Um, and we got to start to rebuild that, and I think you're going to start seeing that now that we're out. Um, people don't have masks. We're congregating on the floor together. We're going out and having outside events. Um, and you're going to start to see that build back. But it's going to take some work for sure. And then organizations like Aspen also play a huge role in ensuring that uh, we have the opportunities uh, to interact with each other, Democrats and Republicans, by, around issue areas that are of importance to the country. And you know, Aspen and other organizations host events um, where you know, take us away from the Capitol and, and give us a chance to interact. Our families get to <clears throat> know each other a little bit and we get to have substantive conversations about really important issue areas. So that's a Murphy really just made an ad for you guys. Yeah, you can play that for your time. Thank you. That clip will be running. You know exactly. We're going to see that a thousand times, that clip. Charlie, you know nice what that work. reminded me of what Stephanie just said? <clears throat> we all came in together. We're all part of the 115th class. And the first thing we did before we got sworn in, we went to Harvard. Yeah. And we spent time there, and as soon as we got here, they start taking steps to divide you. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, where you sit on the floor, uh, you know, two different rooms for conference where they're saying, those people over there, how are we going to outmaneuver them? It's like, those people mm -hmm. are our fellow Americans. Mm -hmm. Like, why are we saying those people? And everything about the institution divides. And um, it's unfortunate, and that's what we got to, that's what we're trying to change. And even obviously. going away on a congressional delegation trip to go, we went to the yeah. border recently, a bipartisan group of us, you know, you spend time together, or the house gym, which, by the way, is like your bad 1950s the high school gymnasium. But that's okay. The bottom line is we get together there, and you see each other, and it's Democrats and Republicans, and you're working out together, and you can have some small talk. That, those are the kind of things that have just been missing, right, for, yeah. for a while, and, and are really important to come back to encourage, you know, actually relationships. Yeah, I always said the house gym was one of the best parts of my congressional experience. <laughs> it really was. That's how you got to meet members, and... Uh, and, and, I know your and locker actually, was right behind mine. That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Flake was my paddleball partner for years, uh, by the way. And so, uh, but it just, just want to get back on relationships for a second. How are, you, how are your relationships with the leadership? I mean, you know, you're the Problem Solvers Caucus, but I've heard some of them, you know, you know I've heard not the leaders, but some of the staff <coughs> privately snicker, oh, the problem causers, you know, mm -hmm. caucus, because, you know, you're obviously doing things that make leadership at times a bit uncomfortable, <coughs> which is good. Uh, so how are you? How are you managing with your respective leaderships? Well, I have the um, <laughs> illustrious distinction of being both a problem solver and a blue dog <laughs> in, in my so. caucus. That that can um, present some challenges. But you know, I think the rule that I've always operated under and um, leadership understands out of me is that I'm completely transparent about where I'm going to be, whether I can be with them on a vote or not, and also provide okay. off-ramps for how we get to yes. Um, and I think that's, whether it's blue dogs or problem solvers, the, the goal being how do we get to yes? How do we not 
you know, um, throw bombs and try to mm. blow things up, but how do we productively try to work together to get to yes? And that's the role that I think both organizations has had with uh, <coughs> leadership. I mean, obviously, you know, leadership, whether it's Republican or Democrat, don't really appreciate people who aren't going to vote lockstep, but yeah. that's not what we got sent to Congress to do. Um, I didn't get sent by the party to Congress. I got sent by my district in Florida, so I have exactly. to be able to represent my community. Yeah. I suspect all three of you have been summoned to the principal's office a few times. Uh, oh, yes. A weekly meeting with the principal <laughs> um, <laughs> at the head of caucus. Yes. Well, and uh, as a, a, a blue dog, too, but not in Stephanie's phenomenal job running the blue dogs, the, the yeah, of course, and I'm sure Brian gets the same thing. You know, I, uh, I certainly get those phone calls. Um, and, and, but it's, you know, I think the best way is to be completely transparent and open. And that's just like, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're working on. This is why I think this is great for the country and why we believe that way. And as Stephanie just rightly said, we don't work for a national political party. We work for our district. And so our job is different than the speaker's job. You know? Yeah, yeah I, have, I have very cordial relationships with the leaders of both parties. Um, you know, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Hoare were very, very gracious to me and my family when we lost my brother. They knew him well. Um, and I have a great relationship with uh, GOP leadership as well. And I think that's our job, by the way. Um, we represent both Democrats and Republicans back home. And we got to be the voice for all of them, uh, not just a certain segment of them. And I think part and parcel of that is building relationships down here with as many people as you can. Yeah, and since we're being completely honest here, uh, I, you know, I, my, my sense is that the proposals that you're providing probably provide some level of discomfort for leaders because these are the things they should be coming yeah. up with. Uh, not you, and yep. um, and you're filling a, a really important mm -hmm. void in this building uh, that in the, in the Capitol that has been missing for some time, frankly, on both sides, where you know, there's a lot of fear of the of the bases. So I'm just you know, just curious about how those relationships you know, uh, can remain strong. And uh, again, I, I applaud what you what you're doing. Uh, so finally, I guess in the in the closing moments here, I, I thought I'd just kind of get your sense to uh, you know what your relationship is with the Biden administration? Have they been engaging with you on a regular basis? Uh, how do they feel about what your efforts are, are, are doing and is it helping them? Yeah, um, yes, we engage with the Biden White House um, extensively, but you know, to be honest, um, we engaged with the Trump White House yeah. extensively too um, in the last administration. It's a critical component of being able to get things done um, is <coughs> not only cobbling together the solution um, in a bipartisan, bicameral way, but you also have to um, be able to get the administrations, uh, at least not their objection. <laughs> and um, and so I think also this Congress, given how narrow the majority is in the House, um, it is a necessity to stay close to, um, for the Biden administration to stay close to House members, especially members who run um, coalitions that can have uh, influential voting blocks that can determine whether or not bills um, uh, move forward and, and get done. Um, and at the end of the day, we have <coughs> a shared goal with the Biden administration, and that is to serve the American people and get things done on behalf of the American people. So we, we talk a lot. Yeah, that's a, a you know, regular dialogue every week. Um, it's very important, right? I mean, they're a branch of government. And just as, as Stephanie just said, the Trump administration, branch of government. You know, some of my colleagues didn't love that we were at the White House, uh, the Trump White House, regularly engaging with them. But if you want to get anything done, you, you have, you know, they have to sign the bill. So, so you, you better engage or you're not going to get anything done. Am I right, Brian? I mean, yeah. Yeah, we've been over there twice. Um, I was over there once with um, the President and Vice President, Secretary Buttigieg, on infrastructure. And then the second time was when uh, PSC leadership uh, met with uh, Ron Klain, Steve Reschetti, to talk about a broader agenda of things that we think could be, you know, bipartisan wins for the country. Yeah, and one final thing we didn't mention, of course, is the other body. Uh, the Senate, and as you know, uh, the Republicans are the opposition, but the Senate is the enemy, right? And so, but you have a, uh, uh, we always uh, say that in a very good natured way about our friends on the other side of the building. Uh, but I just was curious too about, you know, I guess Joe Manchin and uh, Susan Collins are sort of the titular leaders of the problem solvers over there. And how are you doing on a bicameral basis? I know you guys interact. Well, I'm just right. curious what your, how that Yeah, so we meet is. with them, you know, every time we're back. I don't know if it's every three weeks or what, but um, they have their, what they call the G20. Um, Josh and I get invited to that. I think we're there today, actually, Josh. It's yeah, this afternoon. Um, and it's been great, you know? I mean, they've really done a good job bringing us in and understanding that it, it, it's great to be bipartisan, but it's gotta be bicameral if it's gonna get to the president's desk and, and have a shot at success. So 
there's a lot of cross-pollination of ideas. We're talking about minimum wage. We're talking about infrastructure. We're talking about police reform. You know, Josh and I have been working with Tim Scott uh, and Corey Booker on that. Um, so there's been a lot of bicameral work, which is really good. Totally, and you're right. That's unusual, I think. This is, uh, and, and just in the, in the world we're living in, um, of, of this modern Congress, as you point out, where leadership is in, they're not exactly best friends. Yeah. Um, one of the ways you're going to have to get things done is by building uh, coalitions. And if you don't work with, you, ha you have to work with the Senate. And yeah. we've developed a great relationship. And usually, you know, you're getting senators coffee, but now they're willing to actually work with us. You know, it's funny. I, it's, you know, it's funny. I, <laughs> you know, I always, as much as we like to tease the Senate from the House side, um, I always felt that they were, <clears throat> They were very effective in getting us to the, uh, to the uh, final outcome. Uh, and I know that speaks to filibuster, and I don't bother any of you about how you feel about the filibuster, because it's really a Senate issue, not a House issue. Although, to listen to House members, it was when, when, I, when, when I was in the House, I can tell you, if I had a nickel for every time one of the House, more conservative members of the House Republican Conference stood up and said, we need to get rid of the filibuster, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to jam the other side. I mean, and now here we are having those conversations. But the, but the Senate, I always found, was really... Uh, in many ways, better than the House at you know getting to an agreement just because of that. You know, they had to find 60 votes, and that forced some level of dialogue and cooperation that we didn't have that same mechanism in the House. And I'm just curious what your, you know, the, 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 the Senate. You know, they do they do play a constructive role, uh, and uh, even if they are slower, you know, every day is the same over there. They start slowly, and then they wind down from there. <laughs> and so it's a, but they uh, but they do, they, but they do help. Yeah, I think, you know, in, if you are interested in making sure that we sign um, legislation into law, because it's really only laws that actually can have an impact on uh, the lives of the American people, then you have to have a relationship and a strategy as it relates to working with the Senate. Because passing a bill in the House that doesn't have 10 Senate Republicans um, supportive of it basically doesn't go anywhere and it doesn't actually address any of the issues that are so important, um, uh, you know, so that we need actual laws um, signed by the president yeah. to address. Yeah, you have to worry about the sustainability and durability of the laws that you exactly. pass. That, you know, if they're done on a bipartisan <coughs> basis, they're more likely to survive. You know, That's we right. saw it with, you know, on health care and on taxes, you know, each side kind of ran their own agenda and that was that. But, well, good. Well, I just wanted to say thank you uh, on behalf of the Aspen Ideas Festival for this really wonderful conversation and for all of your leadership in, in so many ways. It's deeply appreciated. The country needs it, and we're, we're glad you're there. We really are, and uh, we want, want to have you back, actually in Aspen, in person, uh, when, the, when the things are a little better. I look forward to it. Thanks, don't twist, you don't have to twist our arm on that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks.